Good morning, everybody. Um, just give us a few seconds so we let everyone in. Hi everyone, it's so lovely to see you all. Feels like forever since I've done a coffee morning, so it's uh, lovely to re-engage with you all. Um, right, I think we've got the majority of people in for the moment, but I'll keep an eye on the waiting room. Um, so basically I just want to say uh, welcome uh, to our coffee morning. And uh, today we have the wonderful Isabel uh, talking about uh, wild woodlands, uh, which I'm very excited about. Um, just a little bit of Zoom housekeeping um, before we start. Uh, let me just admit to the other people. Um, please feel free to use the chat function um, during the presentations. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, turning your cameras off um, and making sure you're on mute, that would be wonderful. Um, and we will be recording this meeting, um, so anyone who couldn't attend can view it at a later date. Um, and also, um, apologies for any confusion of the logon um, uh, this morning. Um, it seems that uh, Eventbrite and Zoom had a bit of a falling out uh, this week, uh, so haven't been communicating well with each other. Um, so very glad to see that you've actually managed to get online this morning. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to pass on to Isabel. Right then. Is that working? Okay, Sophie, is that working? Yep, <laughs> I'm on mute. Right, hello everybody. Yes, so um, my name is Isabel Gerben and I am the Principal Ecologist at Surrey Wildlife Trust. And I've been working with Surrey Wildlife Trust for about 20 years. Um, and I started off as a simple surveyor and I still am a simple surveyor really, um, although I do lots of project management work and working with developers. But I think that uh, my role in uh, Surrey Wildlife Trust is really to help give wildlife um, a voice. So today I'm gonna to be talking to you about wild woodlands and it's a bit of a romp through a variety of different types of woodlands, looking at uh, ancient woodlands, ancient woodland indicators and woodlands in Surrey, and then looking at a few um, species as well. So if it prompts any questions, then feel free to ask uh, and we can go through them at the end. So it should take about half an hour. I did it this morning, it took about 40 minutes. So it depends on how quickly I speak, I think. So this is the uh, um, Surrey Wildlife Trust uh, managed woodland um, and you've got large areas uh, in Heathland such as uh, Chobham Common, Brentmore Heath and they, they would tend to be more like uh, pine woodlands. But you also have places like Norbury Park uh, which you'll see a photograph of um, later on in the talk which has uh, beech and yew um, woodland and then lots of other ancient woodlands and you've got one right at the very um, east of Surrey called Starfirst Wood as well and lots of others and some of them are, are larger see, and some of them are very small and that's uh, one of the things about woodlands that you have such a variety of different types and different sizes as well. Um, woodland covers about 22% um, of Surrey and uh, the average, the UK average is 13% so we're up for the average um, but it's still the second least wooded country in Europe. So actually Europe has uh, a lot more woodland than, than we do and their average tree cover is about 44%. So as I said, within the Surrey Wildlife Trust, we manage and look after broadleafed woodland, plantation, ancient woodlands, conifer woodlands, a whole variety of different types. Now this is uh, Norbury Park, as I uh, explained, this one's um, part of the beech woodland. And you've got this sort of, um, sort of a wood, wooded, a chainsaw wooded um, a sort of a point there as well and um, areas of uh, dead wood um, to be can sit on um, and woodlands will provide that. They will provide a lovely area for you to just sit and contemplate and I'm sure throughout lockdown um, many of you will have visited woodlands and just enjoyed the peace and the calm and the 
the um, sort of the smell and the, the ambience that it can give you. Beautiful places to be. This one is an example of um, wet alder cart, wet woodland, uh, and this one is at our uh, Surrey Wildlife Trust reserve called Fundry Meadows. And this one I took actually during lockdown, it was one of those beautiful days last year, and I went with a friend and we went for a walk, and we didn't actually get into the woodland itself, but we sort of skirted around the edge. And um, it was just one of those beautiful, beautiful days, uh, and someone was um, swimming in the, <coughs> in the river, and it was just uh, a, sort of a day where you realise again that actually being out and about and uh, visiting these places is just, just magical and sort of lifts, lifts your spirits. And then we have an example of a coniferous woodland. This one's at Farnham Heath and it's an RSPB site uh, just outside of Farnham. And um, this one is, has been cleverly managed by Mike Coates, who used to also work at uh, Waverley Borough Council. And he has left lots of the, the, the pine rather than cutting all of it down. Um, and again, we want to get rid of some of the pine in order to be able to allow the heather and the heath stem because that's an incredibly important and valued resource. But actually leaving some of those trees is equally important in some places. And he's cleverly designed it so that it you know, seeps into the landscape and adds and connects to other areas of woodland. And it's a really important um, bat flight line and important for certain types of birds as well. So it's how the woodlands work with the landscape as well as the woodland itself. So this is a typical, what you would hope to be a typical ancient woodland, beautiful woodland. This one's Cook, Cooknell's Wood, one of our reserves, and it's a bluebell woodland, uh, typically managed with uh, coppice um, and oak trees. And the UK woods are actually home to almost half of the world's population of bluebells. So we do hold, although a lot of our woodlands seem to have bluebells, actually they're quite a rare commodity over the, in the world um, overall. And this one is a particularly good example of it. So if you're able to get to Cooknell's Wood, it's quite a, a unique place to go to. And this one is Graham Hendry Wood again, another one of our reserves with lots of bluebells. This one um, I went to visit for the first time last year. It's over down by Godalming, uh, not Godalming, uh, Godston. And <clears throat> it's got a small area of, uh, of ancient woodland and a lot of broadleafed woodland that's con it's connected to and it's contiguous part of a much uh, wider, broader area of woodland. So really important in that landscape scale. And the area of uh, ancient woodland has become quite dark over the years and there has been a project over the last winter to do some coppicing and some felling and thinning. And I think because they had the they had one week to do the work and they sort of get, got in there with all the machinery, probably made quite a bit of a mess in inverted commas. It probably looks quite horrible, but actually I think um, it will have churned up some of that seed bank. Um, and I'm, we're hoping that there'll be some interesting flora that will come up as a result of the light being able to get in and just that slight disturbance. So, for example, that's a uh, woodland where um, birds, uh, bird's nest orchid has been seen in the past, but not recently. And it's entirely possible that that might come up uh, again in the future. But it's that consistent um, management that is required for these woodlands. And a lot of our woodlands aren't getting that because of funding. This one is uh, now wood, um, one of our education reserves, or is, is our main one. And this, this one was really taken uh, quite a few years ago, actually. And I went outside and I was doing a, I was training, I think I was doing something. And there was this guy who had been on a, um, a photography course. And he sort of explained to me that I had to sort of crouch down and that I had to wait until the sun went in. And uh, because I was waiting for the sun to come out to take my photo and I took it when it came, when it was in, no, sorry, the, the clouds were out rather. And uh, it, the, just the difference to the colour of the, of the photograph was fantastic. So it's not all about the bluebells. Um, woodlands in general, and particularly ancient woodlands, are, uh, have a whole host of communities of other, uh, other things. So you've got lichen, you've got fungi, different types of fungi, and uh, bryophytes, which will include the mosses and the liverworts. And they all come together. I mean, when you're looking at a tree, for example, it's not just a tree. It's a tree that ho hosts 
all of these, all the fungi, all the bryophytes, all the different types of lichens. It will have birds living in it and bats using it. So it's not just, it's a whole community that comes together to make this one magnificent um, habitat type. And here we've got um, some of the, not, it doesn't have to be uh, all about the rare species, although um, the hazel dormouse is a particularly rare species and particularly cute, and that's why people use it quite a lot. But there are the common species as well, such as the uh, speckled wood and the black common blackbird and lots of different types of bats that will be using woodlands. And of course, with the bats, you don't really necessarily get to see them all that often, but they're still an important part of that community. And the hazel dormice um, is, is there for its cute factor, but also because I had a, a hazel dormice license uh, many years ago, which lapsed, and I'm now uh, looking forward to getting my license back again. But in order to be able to do that, you've got to uh, tick off lots of boxes, and quite rightly so, because they're very rare and endangered, and you need to be able to handle them properly, to be able to sex them, and to be able to do all of the monitoring work um, that, that, that I would like to be able to do. Hopefully this will work. It's just a very short video of a very cute mouse. Okay, so hopefully you got to see that. It was only there for about a second or two, but that's generally all you ever see is them just sort of leaping out and trying to get back into their box um, and trying to get away from you. And quite rightly so, we, we must be quite sort of heavily scented and uh, scary creatures ourselves. But uh, they are quite adorable, um, but unfortunately uh, very rare at the moment. Right, so this is the ancient woodlands in Surrey and this picture, well not picture, but the uh, map has been taken from the uh, ancient woodland inventory of Surrey and you can find that actually online, it's quite an interesting read. And it just shows that the ancient woodlands are across Surrey, um, mainly to the south and often most of them are found in Waverley and, and the, you can see in the sort of Surrey Heath area in the uh, northwest. Um, it's, there aren't as many um, ancient woodlands and that's because that's really the heathland area. Um, but they are sort of fairly scattered. But you can also see that there aren't many big blocks. They may connect to each other, but there's lots of little tiny woodlands um, and not many big blocks of woodlands. And that's part of the management that's happened, the fragmentation, nibbling away at woodlands. You know, it's our, our bad management in effect uh, to some of these woodlands. So ancient woodlands are the 400 years um, or older and they are not necessarily haven't been wooded continuously but they've had uh, you know they may have had uh, felling uh, events but that they've not been uh, they've been allowed to then grow back up again um, so that it was from the 1600s <clears throat> that we take the, the cutoff point and that's because that's when mapping became um, more reliable um, so we've got archaeological features that we can look out for and this is um, from the, um, oh gosh, I can't remember what it's called. It's one of the old maps. <laughs> the, word, the, the name's um, oh, uh, Roke, Roke, that's it. Um, and so from those old maps, we can tell whether they had been woodland then, and then we can take it to more modern times and go through all those different maps and see whether it's been continuously wooded all that time. That's one way of doing it looking at the archaeological features actually on the ground. So when I'm out and about, I'm looking for uh, woodland banks, old woodland banks that have got really old boundary trees. Uh, this is a sunken um, lane and it had um, uh, hawthorn, uh, not hawthorn, hornbeam um, coppice all the way around the edge. There's little things like that and um, that you need to be looking out for. And ancient woodland indicators, this is Ramsons. A uh, beautiful path all the way down and these beautiful sort of scent that you get from Ramsons, which is uh, that sort of garlic smell. And also 
the trees, the woodlands can be uh, a great source for veteran and ancient trees. And it's, oh, they all signify old woodland management. And the difference between an ancient tree and a veteran tree, an ancient tree is old and all ancient trees will be veteran. But a veteran tree is something that's showing um, a, a source or feature that is that will give it sort of will be an old feature. So you can veteranize younger trees <clears throat> by putting in cuts or uh, uh, holes um, and making them have features that would then be an important part of a, of a, a veteran tree. And I'll, I'll give you, I'll show you a, um, a picture later on that will um, show you a little bit more about that. This is coppicing, and that the photograph there, the uh, um, the field layer there is a uh, dog's mercury. So some fun facts: holly is the most uh, is an ancient woodland indicator, and it's the one that you most often see. You see it in woodlands anyway, regardless whether it's uh, ancient. Um, but in 85% of ancient woodlands, it's been detected or recorded. 7% of Surrey is covered in ancient woodland. And 24%, so quarter of woodlands or ancient woodlands uh, have invasive species in them, which is quite a lot. Um, they tend to be things like um, rhododendron and uh, the bluebells, the hybrid bluebells. Those are the sorts of things that will be coming in from gardens uh, and they will be quite, they tend to be quite invasive and a bit of a problem, a bit of a thug. Um, and the vast, vast majority, I was saying that the, the woodlands are quite small and the vast majority of our ancient woodlands in Surrey are between a quarter of a hectare, which is very tiny, to two hectares. And currently the management, a lot of the management or 20% is, is uh, felling, uh, of which 1% is coppicing. And it's a coppicing that really is required to retain all of these ancient woodlands and all the features in the ancient woodlands. It's that consistency of management. But of course, that what it does mean is it's being left 80% of, of woodland just isn't being managed, it's being left, uh, which isn't bad in itself, except for, you know, if it carries on being bad, not managed, the woodland can suffer as a result. This is showing a woodland um, section in um, uh, West Horsley. And you can see here that it would have been part of a much bigger area of woodland and how the fragmentation has happened. And you can see that there are fields in between and little thin areas of the, the um, sketched areas are ancient woodland. So Frenchlands, Frenchlands Cops in the south, uh, the southern corner, um, would have been attached at some point to the Lawless Wood. And then you've got the railway that's then fragmented it even further to the um, area of woodland to the north. But it's not, not all is lost because this is what it looks like. <clears throat> when you look at it on the aerial photograph, <clears throat> excuse me, and you can see that actually, yes, you've got the blocks of woodland, um, but what we do have is shores in between and hedgerows. Some of those hedgerows could be interplanted and widened. And in my opinion, uh, and we have been talking to the uh, landowner about this, is adding in more hedgerows. And it's those connectivities that are going to be really important for all types of um, animals and, for, and, um, and species plants mostly the ones that can move. So for example, the birds, the reptiles, the, the mammals. And often we're finding that uh, dormice are using shores and hedgerows, and that's because they're being managed. Hedgerows generally are between fields and they're actually getting cut on a regular basis. And so they're effectively being coppiced. <clears throat> so this is a lovely uh, quote from Oliver Rackham. Um, a modern wooded landscape is like a library in which thousands of ancient books are destroyed each year by people who cannot read them and do not appreciate their value. Then the shelves are simply restocked with bad paperback novels and pamphlets containing meaningless jumbles of letters. So it's really sort of explaining that um, we can cut down trees but, and cut down woodlands, but sometimes if you're then recreating new woodlands, they're not the same. It's the old woodlands that we need to really look at and bolster and uh, place well into the landscape. So this is a lovely ancient tree. Um, we've got a most, of, most ancient trees in um, Europe, Western Europe uh, combined. So we've got a lot of, of beautiful uh, ancient and veteran trees. And this one is the Tandridge Yew. And it's over a thousand years old. But what's really important about um, 
all these really old trees is that they're home to over 2,000 dead wood or decaying wood invertebrate specialists. And that can include flies and hoverflies. There are over 700 beetles that are associated with this dead wood or decaying wood um, habitat type. So it shouldn't be under underestimated. And a lot of the time when I'm going around and giving people advice, they're tidying up their woodlands and they're removing all the dead wood and the decaying wood and uh, not appreciating that actually that's a fundamental part of the whole system. And also these trees are linked to, linked to our past as well. You can imagine what gossip and what things this tree has seen in the past because it's right in the middle of a, a churchyard. I'm sure it's seen some amazing stuff going on. So this is um, Farnham, uh, Farnham Park and it's taken from the ancient uh, Woodland Forum and it shows where all the veteran trees are. Um, and I know we're slightly coming out of, of woodland, but it's sort of connected in as much as it's a, you know, beautiful trees. Um, and you can see that there are a few around Tongham and a few to the south, but the majority of them are, are in the park because the park has been managed over many, many, many centuries and continues to be so as well. So this is one of the ancient trees in the park. And you can see that one of the branches has, has fallen off and that there's been a lot of pruning on this particular tree. It got a little bit heavy. And in order to retain it and to make it more healthy for the future, give it longevity, uh, each of the trees are being managed separately and they have um, separate management plans for them. Um, and they are looked after by an arboriculturist who will come and uh, annually uh, check over them. And this is what we're looking for. I'm not sure how well you'll be able to read that. Um, but it's basically showing you um, an ancient or a veteran tree rather and all the different types of features that, that you're looking for things like uh, fungal growth, bark, splitting bark, holes, woodpecker holes, rot holes, fungi, branches reaching to the ground and re-sprouting. I mean it's a whole variety of different stuff and that's why they're a whole community, a whole habitat in, the, in their own right. So in the, the southeast of England, we have a lovely book to identify plants called uh, the Wild Flower Guide, and that's um, by Francis Rose. And in the back of there, he gives a little handy guide of all the ancient woodland indicators um, and where to find them. So we've got about 100, and I'm not expecting you to read all of that, um, but it's uh, made up of flowers and grasses, shrubs, sedges and trees. And as I said, the top plants that you're likely to see in an ancient woodland of these ancient woodland indicators are holly and bluebell. But the least common are wild daffodil, sawwort and toothwort. And toothwort I have seen, and it is around, but it comes out quite early. I quite often miss it. Uh, last time I saw it was about 15 years ago. And the wild daffodil is in places like um, Woking Palace, but you can't get into it. Um, Cooknell's Wood, I think, has it. Uh, and Brookwood Cemetery, there are other places as well. Um, but also they're difficult to tell between the wild daffodil, the truly wild daffodil, and also the daffodils that have been planted, um, which is, I personally don't particularly, I understand why people do it, but I don't particularly like it when they do it in uh, ancient woodlands. Um, it's suburbanizing things. So the top 10, holly and bluebell, Looking, so when you're going out into your woodland, you're looking out for other things like field maple, wood sedge, wood speedwell, wild cherry, uh, primrose, and remote sedge. So they're not all um, plant, uh, so they're not all flowers. Some of them are, are, are trees or shrubs, uh, as well as the uh, remote sedge. So lots, lots of things to look out for. Uh, the most I've ever recorded is 40. And that was a brilliant day. I was absolutely fa fantastic. I went into this uh, woodland uh, that was, we were actually managing it, we're not now, it's uh, privately owned now, uh, but it was in south of uh, Cranley and it had such a varied topography, it had geology, it had habitats, micro habitats, it had been managed on a long-term basis and been managed well and there was just, it was just loads and loads of uh, ancient woodlands that kept on chipping over them, it was brilliant. Uh, I found Goldilocks Buttercup there for the first time, that was a real find for me, uh, find it on sort of on clay and on, uh, often on the edge of of uh, pathways. And the reason for the uh, ancient woodlands and the reason why they're relatively rare and that they are found in ancient, ancient woods mostly 
is because of their, their poor dispersal, their short-lived seed bank, um, they don't respond well to ploughing or grazing, they don't tolerate, uh, tolerate shade, and, but they do tolerate and respond well to coppicing. So that's the kind of the reasons that's why they're found in, in ancient woodlands. So have a look at some uh, plants and see whether you can identify them. So this one is primrose and this one is called Primula vulgaris and it uh, means the first rose. And it's one of the first ones, it's out at the moment. I've seen it, I went out on Monday to Holman's Grove down in Grayswood and uh, there was plenty of um, primrose on the edge. Uh, and you can get the pin-eyed one where the stigma is above the anthers and you get the thrum-eyed where it's the other way around and the anthers are more prominent. And it was Darwin who first saw this and realised that um, it was to do with cross-fertilisation. And this one is Yellow Archangel, absolutely scrummy. Comes out in about May and it looks a bit like a um, stinging nettle, but the, the leaves are much thinner and, and longer. And of course they have these beautiful, absolutely stunning yellow flowers really lemon coloured and really be and then there has the, the orange sort of little speckles to sort of guide the um, pollinating insects in. But this is one where you have the uh, variegated version which is the garden throw out. Uh, it's very similar, just as beautiful actually in a way, the flowers, but it does creep along along the, uh, the woodland floor and it's got uh, white blotches on it and it's invasive and it will take over uh, everything. Oh, and the old name for, or the um, Latin name for the uh, yellow archangel, Galeoptolon, um, oh, I've forgotten the, ne next, the other bit. Anyway, um, but it's called weasel snout. Um, so I, uh, that's the old English name. So I rather like that. And this is the one that you would then, assert, I associate a, a lot with the, the woodlands I go to, the bluebell. This is the native bluebell, but of course we do get the hybrid bluebell which has um, flowers which don't dangle quite so much. They sort of remain upright and they're wider as well. The actual bell part of the flower is much wider. But another name for this is um, wood bells. And these are violets. So we've got common violet um, on the left and um, early dog violet on the right. And the early dog violet is one you don't see quite as often. And that one is the ancient woodland indicator and the common one is more common, which is good. For the moment, it's common anyway. Uh, and you can see that the spur on that one is pale, uh, but the, on the early, pale, uh, early uh, dog violet, the spur is as dark as the petals, and that's uh, one of the ID features. There are other ID features as well, um, but that gets more complicated. This is wood spurge, beautiful plant, can grow right up to about your knee height. And it's out at the moment, it is in flower. Um, I mean, this is in flowers, as flowery as it gets anyway. But again, you know, you just have to really get down there and use a hand lens or uh, just be able to see it right up close. It's absolutely stunning. And the leaves are quite, they're quite long. They're about sort of, uh, I don't know, up to about 10 centimetres long uh, or little, just slightly less. And they're hairy as well. But it's uh, quite a nice obvious one that you'll start seeing uh, if you go out into woodlands now. And something that we get at the later end of the year is the crab apple, again, another ancient woodland indicator. And this is a, a lovely one and a rare one as well, Herb Paris, Paris quadrifolia. And apparently it's an aphrodisiac. So, and the seed is something that has like a sort of, um, almost like a, an opium nature to it as well. But I wouldn't recommend um, up, uplifting it or getting it out because obviously that uh, you wouldn't see it very often and it's much better in the ground uh, and left to the insects. Barren strawberry, Potentilla sterilis. And this one, there is another one, um, wild strawberry, and you do find them side by side sometimes. Uh, and the differences are between the petals and whether there's, you can see that there are gaps between these petals, whereas the wild strawberry doesn't have those gaps. And also it's down to the terminal tooth on the uh, leaflets uh, and how hairy it is, whether the hairies, hair, hairs are sticking up or whether they're flat on the leaf. So those are the ID points. And this one's a beautiful one, it's bit of etch. Don't often see it, uh, but it's obviously part of the pea family. <clears throat> so the next slide, this one is all about uh, the phenology 
And phenology is when things start waking up and coming out uh, in springtime. So the first hazel flower has been and gone. Uh, the celandines are out at the moment. Hawthorns are just about to come out. The leaves are about to come out. And the blackthorn flowers are just, just on the, on the coming out stage as well. So that's fantastic. The wood anemone, that was supposed to come out, yes, right about now. And indeed, I, I did see just one on, on Monday. So they are they're beginning to, to start showing. I haven't seen any bluebells yet, uh, but I have seen the leaves. They'll be coming out later. And I haven't seen any cuckoo flowers yet either. And again, you'd start seeing them around about now. So they should be out and about. And then one of the last things to come out, well, actually it's not the last, but the last thing on my list anyway, is the oak leaf. That's something to look forward to. So this is one that I took uh, about a week or so ago. And that's the um, catkins of the hazel. And then that is the uh, flower. And if ever you've, if ever you've uh, not, if you haven't seen it, uh, I would strongly urge you to go out and have a look. I mean, it's small, it's so tiny, it's a couple of me mi millimeters across, but it's exquisite. I mean, it's just, and it's just the most amazing color. And this is the Ficaria verna. This is, means being spring, and it's the lesser celandine. Those beautiful heart-shaped leaves with slight speckling on them sometimes, and the beautiful, it's a, from a runner, well, it was in the ranunculus family, so buttercup family, um, but it's since moved. And it has these beautiful shiny uh, petals uh, and then sort of uh, sort of re re uh, reflect the light and become uh, attractive to insects. Wood an enemy. I saw, as I said, I saw one on, on Monday, so they are out, the beautiful white pack petals and they have this sort of pink venation on them. Um, and they, again, one of the reasons why you don't see very many or you see them in, in sort of um, pockets and patches is because they spread um, vegetatively, not by seed. And the cuckoo flower. So I'm hoping to see that in the next uh, week or so. And the pedunculate leaf. So for the last part of the talk, I'm going to just focus in on three plants. One of them, the first one is uh, Moscatel. And Moscatel is an ancient woodland indicator. And it, um, just let me just, there you go. So the Moscatel is also called the town hall clock and it's small, it's really small and you will almost always find it in an ancient woodland, uh, but you wouldn't find it anywhere else. And it's only specific uh, woodlands as well. So you'd be lucky to find it, but when you do, and it's around about now, it's around about March and April that it comes out. And it has almost like a clock face on six sides. It's just, it's just extraordinary how it's been made that way. It's just amazing. But what's really clever about it is that there are a whole load of invertebrates associated with the Moscatel. Um, and there are larvae of two sawworts um, that use it. There are four species of fungi which are restricted only to Moscatel. And three of those are rust fungi, rust fungi, and they occur on the on the stems and on the leaves. Um, and the flowers are visited by moths, small flies, fungus gnats, gall midges, black flies, caddis flies, pollen beetles, wasps. I mean, there's loads, and they're only out for a few few short weeks before they just completely disappear. It's incredible, but in that time, they're really active and they're really attracting lots of things. And their seeds are supposed to be dispersed by uh, birds uh, and slugs and snails. So it has this really curious adaptation where it, when the fruit um, ripens, it sort of the stalk of the plant goes down and it corkscrews into the ground. And it's thought that that's to help uh, slugs and snails get to the seeds, to eat, eat and munch the seeds and then sort of pass it on through the woodland. And that's called, it's got a technical name called gastropodocry, which I think is fabulous. I'm not sure I said it right, but uh, it's, it's just fab really, really good. And a lot of that information I got from the British Wildlife, and there's this wonderful article called Ascent of Musk, the Lifetimes of uh, Moscatel. So this one is uh, Aramaculatum, and it's Lord and Ladies, or Cuckoo Pint. It's got lots of different uh, colloquial names for it. And you often see the green sort of sagittate leaves, the sort of arrow shaped leaves, and a lot of them are black spotted. 
And in the 1960s, uh, there was this wonderful scientific article, this chap who had gone out and had looked the length and breadth of the UK for uh, Arum maculatum and the leaves uh, to find out that 10 to 15 percent in Surrey, uh, no, in Sur southern England, are black spotted. And actually, they become more black spotted the further north you go. There's, there isn't, I don't think there's a, any explanation to, to you know, give a reason why, I'm not sure. But the other remarkable thing is that when the uh, leaf-like structure holding the, the flower opens, 10% uh, unfurl anti-clockwise and 90% unfurl clockwise. And again, it's not known why, um, but it's something I've been on the lookout for um, to see whether I can find one that uh, goes in a, an anti-clockwise and in a clockwise way. So you've got the spadex and the spades. The spadex is the, uh, the, the leaf-like structure and the space is the uh, flowering structure. And they're both quite slimy. And so what that means is it's attracting uh, insects and they get sort of caught in the sliminess and they get um, taken down into the main part of the flower, which is actually, um, yeah, is in that sort of bulbous bit at the bottom. And what's incredible is that the spadex itself is, um, is held at a, a, about 15 degrees warmer than the rest of the temperature around it. It's quite a lot. And, it's, and it smells of stinkiness, <coughs> feces and dung and, and disgusting things. You can actually get quite close and have a sniff, I dare you. Uh, not nice. And this is what the insects have to go down. So they go down the slimy bit and then they get caught in this slight intricate trap of things they can get down and they cut this like a little sort of a, a locking system, locks them in. And then they rummage around and they pick up pollen as they go. And then eventually I, they get left, uh, let out or they crawl their way out. And that's how they're just, you know, this particular plant is dispersing its seed. And then later on in the year, that's what you then see, the, the seeds maturing. And finally, dog's mercury. The dog's mercury is Mucaralis uh, perennis. And um, you find when you do find it, you find it's carpeting everywhere. But you don't find it generally, you can find it with bluebells, but not so much because a bluebell woodland would be uh, a W10 woodland type woodland and the um, dog's mercury tends to be more of a W8 and it's just a, sign, a sort of a way of categorizing woodlands in habitat terms. And they form patches, mostly males. So again, something else to look out for because the one on the right is the female flower. Now, I, I, I would imagine, I mean, they're out at the moment and they are flowering, so definitely going to have a look because you're going to be seeing this one uh, more often, the, the one on the left, which is the male one but look out for the female one. And then you'll see just a little patch of the female ones. So that was it. That was all I wanted to say, uh, except to say that uh, hopefully you're able to go out and uh, experience your own woodland uh, and look and see what's going on, what's, what's uh, changing at the moment and what's in flower and what's not in flower. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Izzy. That was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> um, gosh. Um, I know where I'm going at lunchtime. I'm going to our <laughs> local nature reserve. I'm going to try and um, spot some things. That's brilliant. Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, please feel free to um, turn your um, video, uh, film. Oh, sorry, I clearly need more coffee this morning. Um, so please feel free to turn on your cameras and wave wildly at the screen or use the chat function. Um, and if you want to ask a question in person, um, uh, we can unmute you. Um, we do have a question from uh, Caroline. Um, how can you tell if a primrose has spread from uh, gardens rather than natural? That's a very good question. Um, I suppose if it was one on its own, um, the colouring might uh, give it away. If it was actually a, um, a, an original primrose, you probably couldn't, but I think it's really where it is. If it's near an urban area and if it looks like it's been planted, then it is. But you generally don't get people planting primroses um, in woodlands itself. Um, I generally find thing, more things like um, uh, daffodils and things like that. 
Okay, oh, brilliant. Um, Izzy, I'm so sorry to be a pain. Could you stop sharing your screen oh, gosh, uh, for me, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, it just helps me see if anyone's waving at the screen um, to ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, I can see uh, Caroline has um, raised her hand. Caroline, would you like to um, ask a question? I'll just... Hi. Um, hi, Izzy. That was absolutely amazing. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just going back to primroses, I mean, would they spread by seed? So if they're sort of near the, you know, nearer to the edge of the woodland, we, we've got a tiny patch, which I believe is ancient woodland. I mean, it's it's, it's sort of really very small. Um, uh, that, and I did see some primroses the other day, but but they were they were nearer to where the gardens are. But that's also the nearer where maybe it's a little bit more open. So I just wondered, I mean, I don't think the garden, I don't think anybody would have gone in there and put them in there, but it's whether they're spread by seed from the gardens or is that unlikely? I think it's unlikely. Um, it, yeah, I mean, I'd have to look, look at it myself to know for sure. Oh, it's please only... come, please come and have a look. <laughs> I would absolutely love you to, I've only just discovered this little patch in the middle of Fetcham and it's next to a recreation ground and it's just been left I mean I and I've been looking at it and it's definitely got, it's covered in bluebells mm. and we've well, got, got uh, white big patches of white wood anemone and it's not been managed so I think if if a lot of the dead wood was taken off in next winter we would probably get a lot more um, I think there might be early dog violet in there and there's an ancient oak and definitely ha um, ash coppicing there's been mm -hmm. a lot of ash coppicing in the past that to me sounds very much like it's a, uh, a woodland that would have all, I mean, all of those are ancient woodland indicators and you, you would and therefore assume at this stage that the primrose is there uh, as an ancient woodland indicator. Okay, yeah, yeah. lovely. It is, uh, sorry, as a supplementary, is there any app that you can recommend that is very good for wildflowers? I mean, I've, I've paid for one called um, Picture This, which is good, but it's, It'll say, it'll say something is an early dog violet. And now, of course, you've explained. I need to go and have another closer look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, because I've been a botanist for such a long time, I've bypassed uh, need, the need for an app. So I can't help you on that one. Although, okay. having said that, um, there was one particular brilliant instance last year. I was in Magdalen Hill, which is in Hampshire. And it's a butterfly conservation. It's a chalk grassland. And I was looking at this flower with my botany friend and we were scratching our heads going, well, I know what it is, I know what it is, I can't, I can't think what it is. And we were there for about five minutes and a guy came along and he said, oh, that's a nice plant, got his app out, took a photo, went, oh, it's da -da -da, and walked off. I can't remember what the plant was now. But um, yeah, so apps can help and can work. And he just put us to shame. <laughs> so I think it's a good start, but it's made me realise that I need to back that up with checking them more carefully and then looking at the books and I think that's that's that that is it's really really helpful for, for, for me to have heard that but yeah uh, I've yeah, got loads of questions but I'll stop because I'm sure other people <laughs> well yeah I was going to say that with um, ID books the more ID books you can get the better um, and you can get them from uh, bookshops and, and secondhand yeah. I mean I've got books on my shelf uh, that I've got for 1p from um, Amazon so mm. it doesn't have to be expensive I've, I've just ordered an out of print um I can't remember the name of the one, but it's a, it's it's the flowers of Surrey that a friend, botany friend of mine's yeah. recommended. So um, yeah. yeah, lovely. That was just so fascinating. I've just got a list. Um, I, I'll look at the recording again as well. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, I can see. Um, and I'm so sorry, your username is Harv. Um, I don't know your <laughs> real name. Um, I see you've got your hand raised if you'd like to ask a question. Sorry, I did I did that when I first set up Zoom and now I want to change it. So I'm Rebecca, everybody. Hi. Uh, <laughs> Hi, I'm Rebecca. Fascinating. I'm absolutely a bit of a, wood, a tree geek now. I'm, I'm, I love walking in woodlands. So this is fascinating this morning. I, I just see that somebody else has just mentioned an app called Seek. Um, and I would just voice it as well. It's really good. And I think it's also helping record where species are on a database somewhere. So by using it, it's free. And by using it, you're helping identify species. And it just doesn't do plants. It does insects as well um, and other things. Um, and it's really good. Occasionally it gets it wrong. Yeah, do check. But actually, I really love using it. Excellent. Oh, somebody's helping me now how to change my name. Oh, thanks. I'll have a look at that later. <laughs> <laughs> so all this
this technology we're getting used to. So my question um, was, uh, you mentioned um, the whole bit about coppicing, and I've been reading a book on oaks about the importance of pollarding. Is that the same or is that different? How does that differentiate? Because it's well, in oaks, because they are what they are, because they were pollarded originally. Yeah, so it's a just slightly different system. So whereby pollarding is uh, much higher, it's a higher cut, and it's uh, leaf stubs, and it's on maiden trees that will then uh, reef, uh, sprout, and, and uh, be allowed to uh, grow into large branches before it's then um, taken back down again as pollard. Uh, and coppicing is when you take it down to the uh, ground. Right. But you can actually pollard hazel as well as coppicing, so you don't always have to take it down to the ground. Uh, and if you pollard hazel, then they're less likely to be nibbled by deer and they're much more likely to uh, survive. Because often if, you, if you're uh, cutting down any trees, you've got to make sure that they're not being nibbled off by the, the deer because then you're just kill effectively killing it. What you're trying to do is, is retain it for future generations and allow it to, to grow back again. Yeah, um, and I'm very near um, the, um, I'm just on the edge of Surrey, so I'm very near Bushy and um, Richmond Park. And obviously mm -hmm. the, more, the ancient veteran trees there are huge. I mean, their girth is uh, huge. And that's because they've been pollarded, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it will be. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your question, Rebecca. Um, we have a few questions on the chat. Um, Bernie's asked, have there been signs of the indicators being um, impacted by climate change, rain and floods, etc.? It's a brilliant question. Thank you for asking that, Bernie. Um, well, I suppose the answer is I don't know at the moment, but generally climate change will be having an effect, but it'll be having a very slow effect. Um, and I think there are more immediate worries for, with example, uh, management and trying to get some of those uh, trees uh, back into a coppiced management, um, because without that, that's more likely to um, stop the ancient woodland indicators flowering. Um, but yes, I mean, uh, climate change will be having an effect. Absolutely. And, and with flooding, flooding will be localised and generally um, that would be more wet, wet, wet woodlands. Uh, and so actually in, in some ways that would have a positive effect. And sometimes uh, we're actually working towards re-wetting woodlands. Um, but you're right, there, there will be flooding events where they're not supposed to be uh, um, Woodlands aren't supposed to be flooded and that will have a localised effect. Brilliant. Thank you, Izzy. Um, right. Oh, brilliant question, which I've actually been talking about all week in various events um, from Hermione. Um, how can nearby gardens best help connectivity? Hmm. <sighs> Well, a whole variety of ways. If you're able to put in a hedgerow, hedgerows are good. Uh, an individual tree that would be uh, that would then grow on <clears throat> into the future, uh, and then so it start to extend that woodland. Um, having areas of um, high areas of, of pollination uh, events, so long grassland with uh, wildflower plugs, um, because you're then going to start attracting more and different types of, of uh, of uh, insects in, but also attracting the birds and allowing the birds to have other areas to uh, to go to and from. But so it's it's really it's about bolstering that those uh, any habitats in a sort of a native way would be useful. So uh, you know um, if you have a small area of a garden that you can just allow to run wild. Absolutely, and funnily enough, that's the th one of the things we've been talking about this week. Um, bringing about a sort of uh, wildlife campaign, uh, wildlife gardening campaign, which will be taking place sort of between sort of mid-April to uh, last until the end of June. Um, and we will be focusing on sort of lots of talks on what you can do in your garden to help connect nature, um, whether it's hedgerows, whether it's leaving sort of a, pe a piece of your garden to be wild. Um, so uh, do sort of um, keep a an eye out for those events as well. Um, I can't see any more um, questions at the moment, and I apologise if you can hear a kettle whistling in my background. It's a badly timed cup of tea being made by my husband. Um, <laughs> guess we're all facing that locked lockdown and being in a close environment with people. Um, but uh, anyway, if anyone has any more questions, um, ah, brilliant, and one's just come through. 
Uh, where do you buy responsible wildflower plugs from, please? Um, I would, I used to go to Flora Locale, one word with a capital F, capital L. I think it, the website is still up and running, actually, although they've disbanded as a, as a, um, a charity. But they used to um, provide a lot of information on local provenance and native um, um, nurseries. So I would, I would have a look there first. That's where I would go to because they had quite good ethics and they um, only put people down um, if they've been vetted very well. Brilliant. I remember, Izzy, I don't know um, if you have an opinion on this, when we did the pop-up garden um, in Guildford High Street, I came across a company called wildflower.co.uk um, and they sell um, wildflower plugs which you can sort of grow. Um, and they also do uh, wildflower meadow turf. It is expensive and they will sort of do sort of local um, sort of native species as well. Um, it is stunning though, absolutely beautiful. Are they the ones in Hampshire, just on the border? Yes. In Hampshire? Yeah, they yes. Are. yeah, extremely interesting. And that wildflower meadow, the turf works so well. I mean, it is expensive. <clears throat> but uh, you can buy a few you can buy small quantities obviously uh, then there's delivery etc so there is that, that problem but um yeah i mean if only we could do that all the time and, and oh, yes. because then that would give because with the wildflower seeding and the plant plugs you need to buy so much and it's so varied whether it works or not whereas the turf you just roll it out and it works is that's it job done it's amazing but really phenomenally expensive but i'm hoping at some stage that that will actually be the way forward and that'll be everyone will be able to do that but uh, other places there's nature scapes uh, they do um and at emma's gate emma's gate's one that we've used quite a lot they've got quite a few different types of mixes brilliant Thank you very much. Um, right, do uh, we have any more questions? Yes, we do. Um, how do you date trees from the girth? That's an interesting question. There are lots of different things on the internet, actually, uh, which uh, if you put, um, you know, you get a, a tape measure and you can measure around it and it gives you a very, a, a, um, an estimate of how old it is. Um, you can also, uh, I suppose you could take out calls if you're being scientific about it and then, and then um, or wait till it falls down and count the rings, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, there are various ways of doing it. And of course, it depends on the species. So you might have an, an oak you'd expect to be absolutely huge and several feet uh, around, but also you'd have, you can have ancient uh, hawthorn, ancient crab apples. And of course, they're going to be much smaller, but actually for that species, they're going to be extremely old. Um, I do things in, in uh, hugs. So if I get uh, about five hugs, and that's, that's a big tree. Wonderful. Um, Caroline has raised her hand. So Caroline, would you like to um, ask a question? Yes, um, I, I'm also a trustee of another woodland actually. Um, and we have wild service trees, oh, nice. which I believe are very slow growing. And we've mm. been trying to find a way of estimating their age. Uh, in comparison with two wild service trees that have been planted on infection streets, actually. And um, so we've got sort of street trees, and then we've got the comparison with the um, woodland. And I just, it's been really, I know you can get, we have looked on the internet for things, but I can't find anything that says how slow growing, I mean, I'm growing some wild uh, service trees from seed, and they are now a year and something old and they're still only that big so they're really tiny I mean they're healthy they're doing well we took the seeds from the woodland so is do you know is there any indication that we could use about how quite how slow going they are to date them uh not that I know of but there might be something out there so I'll have a look and see what I can come back to on that one mm. I presume that we've mm. got your your email yeah with that one when wild service tree they're notorious for not <clears throat> regenerating quickly they're not as common as uh, oak for example um, but what you're doing there with uh, taking some seedlings and presumably you're going to be putting them back into the woodland back that's, into the woodland and we might so sell important. a few to raise money but yep so important i was at a conference uh, or webinar recently and they were saying that there was a you know 400 year old uh, oak that was on its way out but that's 400 years worth of of, of, of genetics of diversity of soil health and what they've done is they've taken some cuttings and they've put some open grown oaks nearby 
And so the, uh, also the community of the deadwood um, invertebrates can go from one tree to another in the future as well. So that, that genetic and retaining that gen, um, genetics in a woodland is super important. I mean, as I, I mean, they are really tiny and presumably I couldn't put them back into the wood until they're bigger. I'd I mean, bigger and should I go and get some soil from the wood? Would, is, is that, you know, to actually pot them into or is that not? That might, that might well help, yes, I'd say, because, mm. you know, there's, there's fungal uh, uh, hyphae and a uh, whole load of stuff in the soil that we just never see. I mean, I was talking about stuff above it, but the soil below is just as important and massively um, uh, div diverse as well. Okay, thanks. That's really helpful. Yeah, lovely. <clears throat> You're on mute, Sophie. Classic error. Yeah, sorry, just trying to avoid background noise. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we don't have any more questions on the chat for the moment, but if anyone would like to um, raise, um, ask another question, um, Izzy, as you can tell, is a precious resource at uh, the Trust. So um, I'll grab her while you can, because she's a very busy lady. <laughs> Super busy. Uh, oh god, no, let Harv have a go because I've just had a go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry, we start monopolizing between Caroline and I. Yeah. It's just my, my, my mind thinking, and it's, it's a bit out of Surrey, but my parents uh, live near, near and more towards Bournemouth, um, and they have a really super large uh, garden, but it's taken from the local heathland. And, and I'm thinking what you've just something just spied me about that kind of putting more rewilding it part of it because they can't maintain it anymore, you know, as they get older they're finding it very difficult. My dad keeps insisting on, you know, keeping a lawn and I'm trying to persuade him not to and go back to more rewilding. It's even got a barrow in the garden. So, you know, as in the ancient barrow, it's that mm -hmm. big. Wow. Uh, so they're very fortunate. And so it's got natural heather and gorse on the barrow. Um, so question for uh, how could we rewild other parts of it? And is it easy to get plants that would naturally be there and put them into one section of the garden to let it go back to its net natural state? So there's several things you can do. You could actually start <coughs> soil stripping just sections uh, near to where the heather already is and hope that yeah. the, either there's a slight seed bank, which actually I, pro I doubt if it's been lawn for such a long time, you probably it's probably affected the, the top layer of soil. But actually taking off that soil level will then uh, allow the, the uh, soil underneath to be exposed uh, and to take off some of those nutrients. And then either um, use some of the heather that you've already got to sort of almost like a green hay. So take a cutting off that right. um, um, heather at the right time of year, late on in the year, and then sort of sprinkle over your exposed area. And you can just do it little by little. Um, or you could see if there's a local landowner where you can uh, take a, a cutting from, you know, sort of take, take those seeds and, and uh, sort of harvest some of that heather and then sprinkle on. Or you could... Um, see whether you can buy some uh some heath mix in as well and, and yeah. do it that way because i think that'd be just really good as well because by nature as well when we've had we're getting we're getting drier weather you know it, it would be the better thing to maintain the whole ecosystem yeah. of the soil mm -hmm. as well to get the heather back onto it to protect yeah. it i just do it little by little yeah you know and you know just sort of incrementally just make it wider as you as you go along and then maybe your dad won't notice yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope he doesn't see this coffee morning. <laughs> Inspiring. Wonderful. Uh, Caroline, would you like to ask your question? If anyone else would like to um, ask a question as well, we're sort of drawing to the end. So um, grab Izzy now. Um, she's um, much sorted after. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Um, I've kind of forgotten what I was going to ask, but there's so many things that we were sort of chatting about. I just uh, just going back actually to the ancient woodland inventory for Surrey. How can we access that? Because I'd love to look up mm, whether our really... tiny bit in Fetchum is on it. I know my the one where I'm a trustee of that's 49 acres with a with a section in the middle which is really old, and the rest of it is secondary woodland. And we're we're sort of fairly on the ball with what's happening there I don't it's called Teasel Wood I don't know if you know oh, yeah, it, I've heard of it. Uh, yeah 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 never been there heard about it though uh, a lot oh, come and visit yeah 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 because um yeah there's a friends of friends for Teasel Wood isn't there 
yes that's yes, what you've been yes, talking yes. about right yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. oh okay. please come and visit it's, it's about to go absolutely mad with the wild garlic it's oh. just covered in wild garlic sure but we're will. fairly on i mean we've had we've got a management plan and we've had a lot of surveys done and you know so we're sort of getting to grips with that um which is slightly different to this other tiny little patch that i found in fetchum and fetchum is the next borough that uh, yeah. village on from leatherhead i don't know if you know it and, and and what we've got is a remnant of what would have been kennel called kennel wood yeah and um i've just sort of really found it because it's right on the it, it was <laughs> it was in what was going to be the m25 so the m25 was i was going to go around um through fetchum or mm. it was going to go through leatherhead and in the end it went through leatherhead and, mm. and teasel wood is right on the edge of it yeah. so but this sway the land that was left in fetchum some of it's become housing but they left in the middle a bit as a recreation ground and um and this bit of woodland which yeah. which sort of people just kind of walk through and don't really or don't even know it i didn't mm. even know it and i've lived in fetchum now for seven years yeah. And because of lockdown, I, I suddenly found it and I've suddenly started to realise it really is obviously a core bit of ancient woodland. Mm. Yeah, so, um, but I'm wondering if it's on the ancient woodland inventory. That was my question. It almost, it almost certainly will be, yes. OK. Uh, it, won't, it won't be missed. But yeah, in answer to your question, uh, you would go onto the internet, Google, whatever, and look up Surrey, Surrey ancient woodland inventory, I suppose. Um, it's that um, easy, is it? I, I, it is that easy, yeah. yeah. I mean, there might be a little yeah. bit of uh, wiggling and jiggling. That's all right. But, I'll, I'll, uh, the whole thing, I mean, it's a whole massive document. Um, and I've got a paper copy, but actually um, on the internet, it also gives you the um, the breakdown of the of the maps as well. So, and although they're not always easy to see, you, can, you will be able to work out where Fetchum is in all of that. Yeah, that would be great because there's a bit attached that's a sort of no man's land that we've just discovered that it belongs to Surrey County Council. Um, and uh, that we think, you know, I want to get that all connected into it and get it protected yeah. as well. So it's quite an important little chunk and it connects Bookham right the way through to Norby Park. So, yeah. you know, in talk landscape corridors, it's very, very important. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, well, thank you everyone for all your questions. It's been totally fascinating as usual. Um, Izzy, I believe you um, running a wildflower course um, at Noah Wood soon? Yes. <laughs> I've just seen I've just seen um, on my notifications more bookings coming in and uh, Izzy is um, obviously a as I said, a precious resource. So if you are oh, interested- Oh, you're talking about that one. Oh, you're talking about, yeah, yeah, yeah that's West Horsley Place, yes. Ah, brilliant, brilliant. Um, so if you want to learn more for Izzy, um, obviously she does um, do our adult learning uh, courses as well. Um, and she will be doing a another talk for us, Coffee Morning, um, uh, later on, um, uh, June, July. I've lost count. I'm organising so many walks and talks at the moment, more of the talks, Ooh, obviously. I'm not sure. Um, so she'll be talking about wildflowers and um, orchids as well. Um, so please do sign up for that one. Um, and yes, there's more uh, talks coming on uh, online because um, at the moment that's the only guaranteed way we can actually get together, um, which is a shame, but we are where we are. Um, uh, Caroline, uh, sorry, you have a question? Just very quickly, I think the West Horsley one unfortunately is booked up. So I think I've tried to get onto that one. Yeah. I've booked the other wildflower one, which I don't think Izzy's doing, although I'm doing the coffee morning with the orchids. Excellent. Um, I think it's Anna Forsbury is doing the one, the other wildflower one. Ah, brilliant. That's Excellent. on the 7th of July, and that I did get a place on, but the West Horsley one, you know, you're very popular. They're very popular, your um, courses. You they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and obviously it's not helped at the moment with um, obviously the restrictions. Um, uh, we're so limited and we would mm. so love to open our doors to more people. Um, so if there is any courses that are sort of fully booked, um, do feel free to message me. Um, I actually did get a message from Sue, our adult learning coordinator this morning, saying, oh, we're fully booked on this course. Can we do a coffee morning or another talk? So please if there's stuff that you would like to learn um or just hear about um just 
um, ask questions, do email me at uh, sophie.code at surreywildlifetrust or surreywt.org.uk or events at surreywt.org.uk. Um, we want to create these events for you. Um, so your feedback is so valuable. Um, Do that, Sophie. Thank you. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so with that, I'm going to draw our coffee uh, morning to a close. Thank you all so much for your support, uh, your membership, your uh, volunteering, and I'm so grateful that we can connect um, with you um, in this virtual world. Um, until we meet again. Um, have a lovely weekend, everyone, and take care. Thank you very much. <laughs>